Well, it's good to see you tonight. And we're here to worship the Lord. this morning, but tonight, we've had some more call us this afternoon that really need prayer. We've got some that uh, actually are struggling with COVID-19 that are outside our community area, family members that are really struggling. Then we have community family members that other things are going on in their life. And when we went off today, all this afternoon, we've texted, called. So while we're waiting for others to come and join us in worship here, you that are here, let's just go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you that we can call upon you. And Lord, there's so many hurting people in our world today. So many physical things that are happening. God, we have family members that are dealing with things that they never thought they'd deal with, the isolation of not being able to be with those that are sick, separation from those that are going to the hospital. And Lord, there is a, just an atmosphere, a spiritual atmosphere, God, that we just speak against it, that you would move and minister in hearts and lives tonight. And Lord, as we worship you, may you be glorified. In thy name we pray.
in that way maker tonight. Thank you, God, that you are a promise keeper. That you have light in the darkness to us. God, we thank you for your presence tonight. Oh, Lord. We honor you. We reverence you tonight. Thank you, Jesus. And everything else can wait. And I've come to seek your face.
Today we were talking to somebody and they said we just want to give you a good report something good they talked about a need that a family member had a financial need there was only a certain amount of money they could spend on something and they gave it to God and God met that number I'm telling you God will take care of your needs tonight whatever you have need of right now I want you to go to the Lord with us and we're going to agree with you that God is just going to meet your need Father whatever we have need of you will meet our needs God you will supply you will make a way we trust you we wait upon your promises. We stand upon your word. And God, we're going to trust you. And we thank you for that. In thy name we pray. Amen. Have your Bibles with you tonight. Turn with me, if you would, to the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 
while you're turning there, I remember conversations I had a few months ago with an individual in the church. We were sitting out in the foyer of the church, and they, they shared with me that there was just an atmosphere and a spirit of apathy that had come upon our nation. And I agreed with them. Not only has it come upon our nation, but it come upon us in a very local basis, local way. Church became an option. If I wanted to go, I went. If I wanted to serve God, I did. If I didn't, it didn't matter. Well, now that the opportunity of not gathering together in a building is taken away, I got to ask you a question. Are you closer to God tonight than you were four weeks ago, five weeks ago, six weeks ago, or have you fallen away? I've been reading a lot of articles about the great awakenings, the great spiritual awakenings that happened across our nation. First one, if you do any study, would happen around 1730 to 1740. And then they'll trace five or six, five major great awakenings, spiritual awakenings that would happen. And then also, we would be reminded of right prior to 9-11, church was at an all-time low. Right after 9-11 crisis was over, the floodgates opened and church went to an all-time high. And about as quick as it went up, it started falling down. A spiritual awakening has to happen with you and I individually. So I want to read something to you that I was reading. I've been reading a few things, and I want to read a little bit. You go to 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 1, but let me read this to you. And this was called, Looking at How the Glory is Departing. That was the name of the article. Looking at How the Glory is Departing. You that are aged can remember 50 years ago when the churches were in their glory. What a change there has been. Time was when churches were beautiful. Many people come, were converted, willingly declared what God had done for their souls. They were added to the churches daily, such that should be saved. Conversions then became rare. Pulpits as we see them, were a place that at one time the glory just overwhelmed and the building overwhelmed. God's presence and power and glory would be there. And then because of life, something happened. We weep to think about it. Well, it sounds like it was written a few months ago. But it literally was written in 1702 in a sermon written by Reverend Mather. 1702, before the Great First Awakening. There was a desperation in the world at that time that God would do something supernatural. People started praying. People started believing that God could do something. So I want to walk with you tonight through some scriptures and give you some ideas and thoughts about what we're going to have to do to see a great awakening it's not a flooding back to a building. It's a spiritual awakening that says, I will never go back to where I was at. I will live in a greater place than I've ever been spiritually, and I will move to a place where I am at, and I'll move from glory to glory to glory with the Lord. So Paul is speaking to the church in Corinth in the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 4, starting at verse 1, and he shares some things that I want to share with you, and we'll kind of break it down a little bit tonight. Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we faint not. He literally is saying, because what happened to me on the road to Damascus, I'm not going to back up. I'm going to preach the gospel. But I've renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. But if our gospel be hid, it's hid to them that are lost. In whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus, the Lord and ourselves, your servants for Jesus' sake. 
For God, who hath commanded the light to shine out of darkness, has shined into our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God into the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be known to God and not to ourselves. Paul was encouraging those who were around him to be weary of using human craftiness. He said to them, the gospel is all you need, the plain gospel. Present the gospel. Matter of fact, the word of God tells us the word of God will not come back void. And he even said this many times, I preach Jesus Christ and him crucified. Paul was not one to talk about himself a whole lot. He was more talking about what Christ was doing in his life. But at that time, even then during the church of Corinth, there was a gospel that was being preached. And let me just put it this way. It was a product that was for sale. They were selling themselves rather than presenting the Savior. They were manipulating people. They were using lying signs and wonders would be a terminology that we'd find ourselves. They were adding to things or taking away from things. Now, the book of Revelation, chapter 22, verses 18 and 19, I want to bring this to your remembrance. For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book. If any man add unto the things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. If any man take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life, out of the holy city, and from the things which are written in this book. Do you remember in the Gospels when the occasion came that men would come to Jesus and he would be talking to them and he would share with them that they were full of dead men's bones. They were saying things and doing things that were not presenting the gospel. First, he was talking to the Pharisees. Then he would literally talk to other people and he would remind them that even though you do it in the name of Jesus, if you don't know him as your personal savior, it's at naught. You don't know him. You can cast out demons in his name. You can heal the sick. But if I don't know you, Jesus literally says, depart from me. I never knew you. Then we also realize that in the, in the Bible, we would find many different places where there were many false prophets. There were a lot of false prophecies. And we see this and we have to understand that if it was happening then, how much more it's happening even this hour that we live in. And we get caught up in things that we find even in the Old Testament. David at one time got more worried about how many chariots, how many horsemen and how many chariots he had rather than depending upon the power of the living God. And I want you to understand something with me tonight. Our ministry can quickly render us helpless if we depend upon ourselves. We have to do it under the inspiration and the power of the Holy Spirit. Matter of fact, there's no way that we can do the gospel today, even especially in the setting that we're in now, if it were not under the power and the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Brothers and sisters, can I just say this to you? There is a lot of voices going over the airways today. There's a lot of people saying a lot of things. There's a lot of phenomenal preaching going on. God is giving a clear call to this world for a spiritual awakening. We need to be awakened spiritually that what we had, the privileges that we had of worshiping God freely in a building, of coming together with those of like precious faith and having that corporate worship, that corporate fellowship has now been removed. That casualty that we had, that apathy that we had, well, well, I've gone to one service, I won't go to the next one, or I missed two or three services. God help us that that leaves us and we get back to that place that it's not about gathering in a building, it's more about having a relationship with a Savior. And then if I have a relationship with Jesus, I want to be in the building with those that are worshiping Jesus. You understand what I'm saying? My relationship with Christ is more important than me going to a building because I am where Christ lives. He lives inside of me. And that apathy, that atmosphere can be right here in my heart in my life. I can lay down my Bible. I can quit studying. I can quit worshiping the Lord. And before you know it, that atmosphere overwhelms me. The things of the world, I start getting involved in them. And we don't want this to happen because what takes place is that when we then start living on a state of emotions rather than living in a spiritual state. 
In the book of Luke chapter 19, verse 46, Jesus makes a very profound statement. And I, I give you one simple thought about it. He walked in the temple and he literally says this, saying unto them, it is written, my house is a house of prayer, but you've made it a den of thieves. It's more about a product than it was a relationship with Jesus. He literally said, you've made it an atmosphere of the world rather than an atmosphere of worshiping and serving the risen Savior. Another thing that I was reading, and I want to read this to you because the, the Academy Journal did a study, and I, I found it very interesting that during the role of faith and religion over the last month, actually they, this just recently come out, it said on Google, there was more searches about prayer than any other item that the week the coronavirus was made public knowledge across America. In fact, that search intensified and doubled every 80,000 new confirmed cases that would come. It would double on prayer, double on what God is, who God is, end times prophecy. And that is people looking for something. There is an awakening that is happening. Can I say this to you tonight? The world is awake more spiritually now than it's ever been. And it's our job as the church to get ourselves to the place of prayer, our place of dedication, where we get to that place where we're, we're more about spreading the gospel than ever before. Paul said in this text not to lose hope, not to get faint-hearted, not to back down. Matter of fact, if you go to the book of Psalms, chapter 2, you'll find a promise that God made for you and I. Psalms chapter 2, verse 7. I declare the decree the Lord had said unto me, Thou art my son, and this day I have begotten thee. Ask of me, and I shall give it to thee, the heathen of thine inheritance, and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron. Thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he said, You ask, and I'll have it come to pass. I will give you that neighbor that is lost. I will give you that loved one that is lost. I will give you that family member that is lost. But brothers and sisters, here's the problem that we had and we continue to have and we've got to change that. We pray one prayer rather than praying till they break through. We don't, there's no longer a lingering prayer, fasting and believing that God is going to do something. Ask of me and I'll give thee the heathen for thine inheritance. I remember there was a time and I had a family member years ago that was about to pass away. She didn't pass away. And I remember going to her and checking on her and she looked at me and she said, this is exactly what she said out of her mouth. God must not be through with me yet. There must be somebody else that does not know him as their personal savior. And I need to share the good news of Jesus Christ. That was her life driven opportunity. God's given me an opportunity to share Jesus with somebody else. She was spiritually awakened that God had given her another opportunity. Brothers and sisters, I pray that God will spiritually awaken you and I during this time, that we will find our quiet time, we'll find that prayer time, we'll find that away time with God, and we'll start letting people's hearts and lives be laid upon our heart. We'll start believing that God is going to save, God is going to deliver, God is going to restore, God is going to heal. But we've got to get to that place where God awakens us first. We must be asking God for this. God, give me that. Give me that desire. Give me that prayer life. Give me that. We have to go to our knees before God and say, God, awaken me spiritually in this hour. Cause me to be attuned to you. You know what I've been praying for the Lord? I've been praying for the Holy Spirit to do something. I've prayed for the Holy Spirit to give me a spirit of discernment that when I text, I sense in that text when they respond that I need to lay it down and pick up the phone and call them. Then I've asked the Holy Spirit to give me a spirit of discernment when in their voice I hear the need. Give me, and this is what I've been praying, give me an ear to hear what the Spirit is trying to say. Help me, Holy Spirit, to hear them, not only just to see what they're doing, but hear them. Hear them. Right now, I can't be around people. Right now, I can't be as close to them and as I would want to be, but I am praying 
Give me a spirit to hear. Awaken me to be very sensitive to the Holy Spirit. We've got to ask God to do this. The Bible tells us that he, if we'll put on the whole armor of God, if we'll trust him, that he'll do great things for you and I. He'll do great things through you and I. And brothers and sisters, we've got to get to that place where we sovereignly say to the Holy Spirit, not by might, not by power, but by thy spirit. It's not by techniques. It's not by technology. It's by the Holy Spirit. It doesn't matter how much. My wife and I have had some very frank discussions about a lot of things that are happening today and how we're having to do ministry totally different. And it comes back to a very simple thing. Jesus Christ and him crucified. It's Jesus Christ and him crucified. Presenting the gospel of Jesus Christ and him crucified. He does the work. He does what we cannot do. He accomplishes what I cannot accomplish. He anoints. He empowers. He draws. But we have to be the willing vessel that says, awaken us to be used by your spirit. Our light that shines, or the glorious light that shines through us, has to be the Holy Spirit. Go back with me to the text, to the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 6. God who hath commanded the light to shine out of darkness. At one time, I was a very dark soul. I did not know Jesus Christ as my personal Savior. I was lost. And then it, there came a time when the light of the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ came into my heart. My mind was dark. Then when I met Jesus, my mouth changed. My heart changed. Everything changed about me. And light started coming out of me. I, can't, I remember so many times when people kneel down to the altar to accept Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. And you see all the darkness on their face. See the darkness around their eyes. And when they get up, you see the brightness of the Holy Spirit inside of them, radiating from them. It's almost like they've come down from the mountain and been in the presence of God. God has a way of changing our countenance. You know how it is to see somebody that's been on drugs be set free and how their countenance totally changes. Well, the Bible says, God who hath commanded the light to shine out of darkness had shined it in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Everywhere I go, I need to awaken people to the atmosphere that I've been with Jesus. I've been with him in my prayer closet. I've been with him with my Bible study time. I've been with him with my devotion. I've been with Jesus. I must be about the Father's business. The Bible tells us in the book of Mark, chapter 16, verse 15. He says, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. We understand this is the great, great commission. He that believeth is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. These signs shall follow them that believe. In my name you cast out demons, and they shall speak with new tongues. There is a liberating presence and power and glory of the Holy Spirit. And brothers and sisters, you see signs that God has intervened in their life many different ways. He says we have this earthen, this treasure in an earthen vessel. I heard it this morning preached. Brother Henry Todd mentioned it this morning, but I want to share it with you again here tonight. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7 through 11. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels. I'm a clay pot. That the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. We're troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We're perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. Always bearing about the body, the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus may be made manifest in our body. When you see me, you ought to see what Jesus has done in me and through me, and it ought to be coming out of me. This clay pot represents the presence of the Holy Spirit dwelling inside of this temple. 
Understand with me tonight, there has come a time in my heart, in my life, and in yours, and we pick it back up in verse 11. For we which live are also delivered unto death for Jesus' sake, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. My greatest task is to present Jesus to my neighbor. My greatest task is to present Jesus to a stranger. My greatest task is to pray and believe that God is going to bring in the greatest harvest that he's ever brought into the church. My greatest task is for you and I as a body of believers. And if you go to our church or you go to other churches, your greatest task right now is to start praying and believing that God is going to do the greatest work that he's ever done before. Souls are going to come running to his presence in their homes, wherever they're at. It's been amazing to us that for the last few weeks, we've had people call us, talk to us about their salvation, rededicate their life to the Lord. And we've had many of them say, and this is what I've loved, when we get back to normal church, I promise you, Pastor, I won't miss services. I used to go because... I just went, but now I get to go because I want to. I want to be back with those of like precious faith. I want to be around those that are assembled together. I want to be in God's house. That's a start of a spiritual awakening. It's an awakening of, I want a prayer life that is greater than it's ever been. I want Bible study greater than it's ever been. I'm a, I want my walk deeper than it's ever been. Matter of fact, Paul would say it, that you go from glory to glory to glory. And brothers and sisters, that's what we've got to do. We've got to get to that place. Listen to what he says. For we which live are always delivered unto death. Verse 11 Say that the life also in Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal bodies. Can I say it in a way that you would understand it greatly? Paul probably said it better than anybody else. I die daily. I die to the old nature. I die to the flesh. I die to the desires of the flesh. I die daily. This did not give you more time to do things away from what God had. I would be willing to say, and I pray it's not you, but there are some that their devotion life is less now than it's ever been. Their prayer life is less now than it's ever been. Everything that we know that could take time from us was basically taken away except for school, and work, and those things that we have. And I, I've heard this statement, and, and it's true, and don't get me wrong. Pastor, we're having to do work, and then we're having to do homeschool, and we're having to do this, and we're having to do that. But can I say something to you? It used to be that you had work, school, ball, TV, movies, running to Walmart, running to Sam's, and doing all these other things, and at that time you had time for God. There's less things that you're doing now, and if you've got less time for God now, I pray that there be a spiritual awakening in your heart. Then the other group of people, there's another group of people that have had a devotion life like they've never had before the last few weeks. They're reading God's Word more than they've ever read it before. They're praying more than they've ever prayed before. Why? Because there's been a spiritual awakening. The negative attitude that we have and the attitude that we keep can keep us from getting where we need to be with God. Let me share a scripture with you tonight as we close. And it's a very familiar scripture. It comes from the book of 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. You know it. It says, If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face, turn from their wicked ways, then I'll, I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sins and will heal their land. When he says, if my people, he is literally saying, you and I. He's speaking to his people there, the nation of Israel. So I'm going to change this just a little bit to fit what I'm talking to you about tonight. If I will call him by his name, if I will humble myself, if I will pray, 
if I will seek his face, if I will turn from my wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven in a new way. I will have my sins forgiven and God will start a healing process inside of me that will then flow over to those around me. A spiritual awakening. The eyes of the Lord are running to and fro, seeking whom he may touch. I said to you in the very beginning tonight that there were five very distinct spiritual awakenings that happened. The first one happened in 1740. But I'm saying to you, as a church body, and I'm speaking to our congregation here, and to you that know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, we have an opportunity to awaken ourselves spiritually without the distractions, a lot of the distractions of the world that we've had. I'm, I'm, I'm going to just talk to you a minute. I think some of you are watching more TV than you've ever watched. I think some of you are, are feeling time that you could have had with God with other things. It's strange. Every idol of this world has fallen down. It's like in the Old Testament. When God's presence was put in the front of the idol of Dagon, the idol fell down and they picked the idol back up. The idol would fall down and they'd pick the idol back up. My prayer tonight, kick the idol down. Kick it. But it's got to start inside of you. A spiritual awakening has to happen. If you'll go back and look at every great spiritual awakening, all of them happened when a group of people and sometimes it was a very small group of people started praying and believing that God was going to do something greater than he's ever done before. It's my prayer that God do something greater in Choctaw County than he's ever done before. That there be a greater harvest of souls than we've ever seen. Wherever you live, wherever you attend church, there be a greater harvest of the lost. Folks, it's not about how many is going to come back to church, but it's how many will accept Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. How many will come to a place where they will move into a realm of knowing Him and serving Him and worshiping Him in spirit and in truth. Father, we pray tonight for a spiritual awakening. But it's got to start with me. God, you've got to jar me like you've never jarred me before. You've given us opportunity to seek your face. If the world is Googling about prayer, about end time, Shame on us as a church if we're not on our knees praying with expectation and anticipation of what you're doing and what you're going to do and your glorious return. Lord, may there be a latter rain. May there be a move like we've never known before. Hear our cry. Hear it tonight.
I want to challenge you. Change your routine. Change your routine. Find more time with God. Ask the Holy Spirit to awaken you. Spiritually awaken you. And if He spiritually awakens you, and if He spiritually awakens me, and if He spiritually awakens another one, before you know it, there's a spiritual awakening that will come across our nation. I don't want revival somewhere else. I don't want to read about revival somewhere else. I want to experience revival right where you live. Right where you're a part of. That is what we need. Spiritual awakening. May God bless you.